Hello and welcome back to another episode of You Want to Do What. Today we've got Joe Fatterini on, who is a wine merchant. Hi Joe. Hello, thank you for having me along. Oh pleasure. How are we today? Well you've slightly interrupted my wine drinking window, so um, <laughs> no no. <laughs> Although as a wine merchant it can be a somewhat wide window because it can start at about seven o'clock in the morning and run through till goodness knows when, so it's uh, there's an awful, well, wine tasting window anyway. They, they can be fairly <laughs> lengthy in the wine trade. So do you want to tell everyone a, a little bit about what you actually do, Joe? Yeah, I can. I'm, I'm a wine merchant. So my job really is a sort of, it's, a, it's rather like, I sometimes liken it a little bit to being a swan. On the surface, it's all very elegant and beautiful. My job is to go and bring wines to life for people. Um, and I've done it in shops and I've done it in the trees selling to particularly hotels and restaurants. That's actually where I spent the, the big chunk of my career. I've done it in specific events. And in fact, I've ended up doing it on television uh, latterly. So the idea is, you know, you, you bring wines to life, you make them very attractive, you find out what sort of wines would, if you like, make people's lives better. Um, you know, weddings, I did, I've done celebrity weddings. I, I did the champagne for Piers Morgan's wedding. And I think did all of them for, it was one of the, the hairy bikers i can't remember which one it was anyway he had a wedding in cumbria i remember sorting wines out for that underneath that really very elegant and great fun sort of swan on the surface <laughs> is a furious amount of scrabbling around so as a wine merchant a lot of the time as well you're also looking into things like supply chains dealing with tax getting wine in there are the nice bits choosing wines tasting them saying i like that that one i'm not so keen on um, but also the really challenging part. Sometimes, you know, my early career, it will be shifting enormous numbers of boxes, sort of tons of boxes. I remember it was a football champion, it was a Champions League final in Glasgow, and we opened it with several thousand bottles of wine. And it wasn't until the end that uh, we realised that we thought we were dripping wine everywhere. And it turned out that our hands had been, we'd, we'd opened so many that uh, our hands were all bleeding. And oh actually there was blood that was falling all over the place. Jesus. So it goes from the incredibly glamorous, you know, and I worked for, for Berry Brothers and Rudd, wine merchant to, 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 to Majesty oh, wow. the Queen, the oldest wine merchant probably in the world, certainly in the UK. It's got a beautiful shop, isn't it? In it's London. utterly gorgeous and, yeah. and there's something very magical there you sort of welcome people into a shop that hasn't changed fundamentally since 1698 and talking about wine to people about the wines you love that they'll you know find fabulous right the way through to the other side which can be you know sitting in a um, when I started selling into hotels and restaurants you know we worked out of a, a sort of industrial estate in the Gorbals and I would be going and collecting cash from gangsters who'd been buying bottles of wine from me, you know, that sort of thing. So it can, it can vary these things. I mean, I've, you know, I've had, I've been followed home by special branch um, on, on one occasion because somebody was such a dodgy person. Um, I've been sent away because there was a dead terrorist in the lavatory. Um, oh God. You know, there have been some quite extraordinary tales. Um, so, you, you know, you can go from one extreme to the other, whilst at the you know, same time I've drunk £26,000 bottles of wine with David Beckham. So oh, wow. you, you, get the, you get the full gamut of it. So where did this all start for you then? Did you always have a love for, for wine? Were you introduced to it by your family? Where did it all, all start? I think there's, there's a common narrative, and certainly it's true in my case, um, I sort of knew quite a lot about wine when I was a child. My grandfather used to enjoy nice wines. My parents drank it, not as great collectors. I mean, I think we used to have an awful lot of these they're called Paul Masson California carafes. And um, people loved them because you could make orange and Ribena squash with the bottles afterwards. They were these sort of carafe shaped <laughs> bottles. But I was very familiar with wine. And certainly you know, there's some tale of when I was about seven and drinking, I think it was Latour 45 or something, which is hideously expensive now. And and enjoying it and saying, oh, this is, you know, this is great stuff. And sometimes that's quite off-putting for people who want to join the wine trade because they think, well, I didn't have that kind of a background. You, you don't need it, to be honest. Um, and if anything, it can be something of a hindrance, as I'm sure we'll sort of <laughs> discover. People sometimes come in because they just find wine utterly fascinating. It wasn't actually the drinking of it. As a child, I was really fascinated in fundamentally kind of facts. I was just, you know, 
trivia hound. And wine is one of those things which is very useful if you're a trivia hound because there's endless amounts of it. Mm. You know, this grape, grape, grape grows there. It's named after that. It's made by them. It grows better there than it does in the other place. You end up with this unending pile of trivia that you can learn about and that you can apply in your daily life and in your sort of job. And I found that, you know, compelling even as a child. What you do tend to find with wine, <clears throat> excuse me, is that, of course, when you do your career test at school, it never, ever throws up, you should be a wine <laughs> merchant. It doesn't happen. You know, it's not one of those things where teachers say, well, if you want to be a wine merchant, you better go and take these exams. Mm. Um, and it tends as a business to be a thing. I and mean, I suppose the two parts, one is because it's not there, like being a lawyer or an accountant or something, or, you know, soldier, um, and farm and whatever. It's not one of those things that people tend to aspire to. They tend to drop into it. So it's often a career where people go, other options are not open to me. I better become a wine merchant, uh, which is certainly my case. I was going to be a soldier. That was all I was ever going to do and ended up joining the wine trade because the army wouldn't have me. Oh. And I met lots of other people who were in a similar situation. They were going to do something else and they failed their law exam. So they became a wine merchant or they got bored having been a lawyer and they joined the wine trade, you know, and some of them very successful, mm. hugely successful, you know, worked in the city. Well, I just found that really, really boring. I want to go and do something I love, which is the other side. It's a passion business. People do it because they find wine utterly fascinating, which is both a good thing. And actually, it's a, it can be a, a great hindrance. It's, a, it's both good that people want to join the wine trade and they love it and they get to go and work with something they, they adore. On the downside, it does mean that the wine trade is full of utter weirdos because <laughs> um we all think wine is amazing and yeah. we love every bit of it we are very weird compared to the general population so the wine trade often has lots of people who think that the world of wine is the be all and end all of course you're mostly selling overwhelmingly selling to people who think it's quite a nice drink to have with supper <laughs> and so even my advice to anybody who joins the wine trade yes absolutely indulge your passion remember you are weird. You have to actually remember most people just want something that's quite nice to have with spaghetti bolognese. <laughs> so is this still the case nowadays or are there now qualifications or things you can do within the wine world of wine? The, the, wine, the wine trade has actually got a, an extraordinary array of qualifications and in you can come in in different routes. The most likely, and I've done it and pretty much everybody does it who, who joins the trade in a reasonably professional capacity, um, goes through the qualifications of the Wine and Spirits Education Trust. You don't need to be a wine merchant either to do it. It used to be the case that certainly for the, the diploma when I did it, you had to have sponsors in the business who said, oh, yes, you know, I know this person. They're allowed to do the qualification. Now anybody can do it. You've got to be pretty committed if you're not doing it for your job. I mean, it's two years. It's incredibly hard work. It's broadly um, lots of it's lots of self-study. You then attend classes. It involves lots of complex essays. But there are the other qualifications. First, you've got, um, I think, the, the intermediates and the advanced. They are challenging qualifications. They, you know, they're, there's no two ways about it. They're, they're, they're difficult, um, but they're not any. You know, the the diploma is what would you call it? You know, HND plus. You know, it's um, it's a proper professional qualification in mm -hmm. in the world of wines and spirits. Um, so that certainly is one block. Um, when people are in the business, they might then go on and choose to do the uh, Master of Wine. Um, it's not a master's degree. As in a master's degree, it's called the Master of Wine. Um, you become a master of wine. That is done um, very much with self-study. The pass rate is vanishingly low. There are only 400 and something who've qualified ever. I was going to say, this is the, I think, was that in the wine show? Uh, we did sort of briefly that. discuss it, yeah. yeah. I studied the MW for, for quite a lot of years, it was four or five years. Um, I'm a not unusual candidate because although I did quite well in, in when I first did the exams, I passed my theory papers. You do theory, four theory papers and three tasting papers and then a, a research project. I, I passed the theory papers straight away and I nearly got all the tasting papers straight away, which is very unusual. Uh, I think only one person in my year did the whole lot in on their first attempt. Wow. Um, 
but after my second attempt, not on YouTube, I remember somebody saying it was about a third of people doing it get divorced because it's so demanding on your Jesus. sort of life. And uh, and I was one of those who got divorced. And actually, divorce lawyers tend to say, yes, well, if you want a house, you can't do this anymore. So <laughs> drop out. So I'm very, um, it's a disappointment then didn't do it. <laughs> but then you also have, there are degrees. So you can go and do degrees now at uh, Plompton College um, down in is it Sussex. Uh, West Sussex, a uh, brilliant course down there, an amazing team of people. They have two tracks. One is in broadly the business of wine, I think, and one is in winemaking and viticulture. Um, there are people who study overseas, certainly the University of Bordeaux has a very good uh, course over there. So there are a number of international courses. People study in, in the United States. You can go and study at the University of um, uh, California at the Davis campus. So there are a number of places now in the increasingly you can, can what study. an amazing degree to be able to go to university and do i mean university for a lot of people is certainly a bit of a party time isn't it and lots of drinking going on anyway and actually that's your that's your job that's your degree <laughs> it is and, and at plompton you get to go and make your own wines and then they get sold commercially and oh, wow. in, more than once twice i've come across them in exact in um in tasting competitions this is fabulous and then you discover it was a research project from the students at plompton. <laughs> um i've been very lucky i've gone and, and done sort of lectures with them but and they're an amazing team down there uh, and it's grown rapidly largely i think because the um the english and welsh wine trade so if you like our domestic production industry needed to go and have people to come who had the skills uh, both as winemakers viticulturalists in the vineyard winemakers in the, vi in the winery uh, and then also in the business of and there are certain you know distinctive qualities about um about selling wine you know wine is a it, every industry goes oh we're different there is an element about wine that's different i mean you know it's eight thousand years old um <laughs> i said to somebody once i said i think there is one trade that's older but on the whole you don't tend to advertise it um <laughs> uh -huh. you know so we know that people have been buying selling trading making wine for at least eight thousand years um sort of from what's today modern day georgia and then it's sort of spread out from from there um, you go to you know, like the port of Jaffa in Israel. Um, that was probably the first export center for the world of wine in, in some capacity out into sort of the Mediterranean. I remember visiting it and thinking slightly weird, you know, people have probably been here for about 5,000 years, sending mm. ships out around and about. Um, but also for a variety of reasons, because lots of people want to join wine trade and want to make it, the margins on wine are globally the lowest of any retail sector in the world. Oh, really? So the, the gross retail margins of wine are the world's tightest. Jewellery, I think, is the, the world's highest. So, you know, retail margins only maybe 30, 28, 30 percent, something like that. In jewellery, it can be 60, 70 percent. Most products, retail products, sit somewhere in between. Obviously, so does that have um, a bit of a a bit of a difference though? Because I guess some wines are produced at such a vast scale um, that they can afford to to sell them, you know, quite cheap. You know, you pick up a bottle of wine in a supermarket for a couple of quid. It's been like super mass produced. But there's then obviously, I guess, there's the wines from your established places like France, um, Spain. You know, I'm thinking Europe mainly um, mm. it, from smaller wineries that are well established their margins are quite vast aren't they this certainly can be there are sort of huge bits as retailers sometimes that doesn't really apply and so sometimes selling very very expensive wine can be done on extremely narrow margins really? and there's a bit more cash in it because lots of people would love to go and sell those wines mm. the market to be the person who sells them can be very narrow uh, the producers themselves may make you know an awful lot of money and, and certainly that's the case in champagne for instance mm. champagne producers themselves can be hugely profitable um actually selling champagne can be one of the lowest margin things you do as a retailer oh, wow. uh, in the uk it can be very very tight particularly around christmas you can be almost loss making because the, the margins are so tight whereas if you're bringing in very large volumes of, of wine i mean the uk has i think certainly the largest wine processing facility in Europe is in, I think it's in Avonmouth, um, although there's a, another one up in the northeast of England, which I think is Europe's most environmentally um, sensitive, environmentally friendly wine processing facility. Because actually what we do is we bring lots of wine into the UK in essentially massive bag-in-box things. So it's like an really? entire 
container filled with a bag of wine <laughs> and then we bottle it over here and it's um, environmentally it's much better actually more than half the emissions the carbon emissions of a bottle of wine are just moving it around um so because you can think it comes in bottles bottles themselves take a lot of carbon to make you just got to shift this glass bottle everywhere so actually if you can bottle it in the uk um it's much more environmentally friendly mm. now that's the the less sexy end mm. that said for an awful lot of people it's a hugely rewarding career because you you're often dealing with some of the best known brands in, in the uk often it can be financially sort of quite interesting and actually technically it's a fascinating challenge so i certainly wouldn't discount it i think selling very smart bordeaux for instance to very wealthy people in london and i have done this <laughs> this uh, <laughs> there are moments when it's terribly glamorous you know I remember once coming out of a tasting and we we totted up but i think we got through something and yeah it, it's hard to sort of say but it was a thick end of forty thousand pounds worth of wine oh my the, word seven of us over there <laughs> Um, that's lovely. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> um, but actually, it's a pretty small part of the, the sort of overall market. And a lot of people want to get into it. And you sometimes have to work a very long time to, to sort of get into those you know, those little interesting areas. Um, so, so as a wine merchant, are you always looking for the next kind of, not the next thing in wine, but something that's up and coming. So, for example, we had a uh, we had a sommelier on a while ago, um, mm. and she was talking about the UK and how something about the climate slowly changing is making the UK more attractive to grow grapes. And some of the big French winemakers are buying land in the UK now because they're looking to the future and and seeing the quality of UK grapes and vineyards increase. So, are you always looking for that kind of okay? We should jump on that now. And there's an element of that. Um, I think you, you, there's sometimes people, there are certain parts of the trade, and this is what makes it so exciting because you find a thing that's, you know, really grabs you. Um, you know, I always, I, I've been a sommelier and, and, and a lot of my career actually has been selling to sommeliers, a particularly interesting group of people to, to sell to. And there's a real information exchange because you listen to what Soms, sommeliers are talking about on the floor and she'll say you know this is something we're getting a lot of demand for and as a merchant you then feed that back and then you go back and you maybe find new products that you can have in, in your portfolio to satisfy that sort of demand or even sometimes going back to producers and saying you know there's a gap here that you don't have there's a thing that people are looking for the rise of you know, climate change has changed the world of wine um there are certainly going to be regions which will struggle to make wines in the way that they have wine is acutely sensitive to changes in climate which shouldn't come as a surprise because of course we get vintage changes so we know you know vintage a is better than vintage b um 2018 for instance was an extraordinary english vintage it was that very beautiful warm summer and made wines that we might not see the like of for another 10 20 years who knows um we certainly we don't get 2018 style summers every year um so yes what you, what you do is you sort of go and find these little bits now there are some parts of the trade where people want to look for that a lot the other side is that there's a large part of the market where people sort of want to drink something that was a bit like the thing they had last night. They like <laughs> yeah. a certain consistency. <laughs> and there's a real value in saying, you know what, I'm going to go and find a way of consistently giving you the thing that actually you, you know you want. We might nudge you slightly, but broadly you're like that. And that's not always... Um, at the very commercial sort of boring end. Sometimes that's characterised as, you know, people just going and finding cheap supermarket reds and whites. Actually, if you think about, I mean, one of the great um, caricatures of the sort of wine trade is sort of crusty old colonels who go grouse shooting <laughs> and whatnot. And they do drink a lot of wine. And actually, they all drink the same thing year after year. They just drink endless amounts of minor Chateau Bordeaux. <laughs> That's what they like. So slightly stringy clarets or bottles of Burgundy. And they, you know, they're not very that adventurous. So non-adventurousness is certainly not a class thing or even a wealth thing. I mean, just lots of people aren't that adventurous. And that's fine. Let's go and find wines that sort of satisfy them. I think really great wine merchants are very good at bringing together um, what they know, the little market that they're speaking to. Now, you know, if, you, if I'm selling in, in East London and I'm working there, you know what people want? They want really interesting new stuff. 
every day something slightly different. Who's this producer who's got a really thrilling story? Who's doing something that's absolutely on the edge? And you've got to go and find that. And you've got to bring it to life. If you just bring out old bottles of claret, they'll sort of tell you to it's a bugger off. <laughs> Whereas try and tell a colonel and sort of say, you know, they might, well, some crusty old colonel may spend a lot of money on wine. But really, they just want to drink smart old, you know, sort of young white burgundy and old claret. And telling them that this is something made in a Georgian quevery, but it's been done in, I don't know, Serbia, and it's made from some unusual grape variety, and it's absolutely thrilling. And they're not going to want it at all. So th there is a real, it's a very human job. It's a very human job of matching what people really want with something that, you know, wine is not a functional product. It speaks to who we are. Mm. It often tells a narrative about who we are. And we use wine, like James Bond, you sort of use wine as a way of announcing yourself to the world. And you've got to be hugely sensitive to that very often. I think with wine, I, I personally love the kind of the the kind of theatre of it almost. So, you know, you're having Sunday lunch and you, you get a nice bottle of red out and you decant it. And it, it, there's something about that kind of a little bit of theatre that makes it feel extra special, isn't there? There certainly is. And, you know, my advice to anybody who's joined the wine trade, uh, there are certain things, there are certain tropes that it's probably worth going and avoiding, um, largely because they're either not true or everybody else has done them. I mean, one of them is uh, I'm on a mission to demystify the world of wine that's the actually people love they certainly love the mystique i mean mm. if it's mysterious or mystifying then perhaps they don't go in like that but certainly people like the fact that you can have it's a bit performative that you yes. can have a bit of a display yeah. with it that you do make a bit of a fuss about something that's nice um you know it's rather like sort of saying well i'm going to demystify the world of weddings and turning up you know in a boiler suit that's covered in engine oil or something you know you get <laughs> dressed up for a wedding because it's a special occasion you decant a nice bottle of red because it's a really nice expensive bottle of red yes um and so when sort of people come to wine and then they sort of say it's become a trope people sort of say oh you know i'm going to demystify it as so i think slightly on the basis that it sort of says i'm not one of those people who's you know all crusty and and whatnot yeah they often come up with exactly the same carry on as people are sort of old and crusty and people <laughs> do love the mystery and actually let's revel in it let's make the most of it let's have sort of fun with that so there are two or three of, of those kind of tropes that sort of float around you know as a trade as people get involved in it they often um see a caricature of a wine merchant as being usually a middle-aged rather portly sort of white relatively posh man wearing red trousers and a tweed jacket and probably an old school tie and so on now i am not in any sense saying <laughs> these figures don't exist in many ways actually they are utterly charming kind generous mm. people who would fall over themselves to go and help anybody who joined the business they will open up the most extraordinary bottles of wine for you because they've been very lucky and generous to go and enjoy them um, they are certainly not the uh, kind of discriminatory, exclusionary people that you you sort of might imagine. Um, and actually, there are far fewer of them in the wine trade than people perhaps give credit for. Yeah, it's actually a pretty welcoming, inclusive place. Mm. And if anyone listening thinking, I you know, I'd quite like to to have a go at being a wine merchant. What's the the first step to getting into the industry? Yeah, I suspect the first thing actually is probably to do those exams. Go and get yourself signed up at the Wine and Spirit Education Trust and, and get going, partly because you'll learn lots about wine. Uh, the other part is you'll start learning lots of other wine people. So there'll, there'll almost certainly be people on your course. There'll be some who are just wine lovers, but there'll be some people who are joining the business and they're, they're joining along. And there are a number of, the, the trade has a number of organisations that welcome people in. So the, the WSET itself, actually has a very good jobs notice board. Um, there is a, a, a business called the Drinks Trust, which is um, a, a, it's a charity which actually looks after a great many people who've had a career in the trade and they're, they're at the other end of their career, but it also welcomes people in at the beginning of their career. They have a, a brilliant um, website community called the, um, the, the, the Drinks Community. And there, within the Drinks Trust community, you'll find people who are keen to welcome you in, give you career advice, 
go and put you in touch with people, all that sort of thing. Because it's it, there were there used to be certain routes here. Obbins in the old days was a classic. Obbins was a big recruiter, particularly university graduates who wanted to join the trade. They would get a basic training. They'd eventually run a shop. They'd then go and look after restaurants. They'd then go and do something else. And a lot of people in there. I guess probably late 40s, 50s now in the wine trade, probably came through the odd bins route. Uh, Thresher, which was my own sort of route in, I worked in a brand they had called Wine Rack, did a similar thing, sort of similar kind of way through. And um, Majestic is the one key retailer who mm. does an awful lot of recruiting and trains you up, gives you all your courses, you get to go and work in a shop, you get to go and learn lots of stuff, you get to try lots of wines, and then... Um, and then progress through. So those are, you know, two or three of the sort of certainly the key things that I'll go and pick up. And I think you've you kind of alluded to it earlier. Um, but what are some of the key personality traits that you need to to be successful as a wine merchant? It is. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll give you a sort of slightly odd example. I mean, among the the things, one of the big shifts in one at the moment is moving into e-commerce. And actually, if you have a blended skill set, and certainly one thing, one piece of advice I've given lots of people when they come in is be good at two things: be good at wine and another thing. So certainly, when I joined the wine trade, I'd become a chartered marketer. So I was both a, a wine specialist, but I was also a chartered marketer, which brings together two powerful skill sets which means that you're then a great specialist on top of wine marketing other people might well have a language skill so they create a wine but then they also can speak french or german or something and they can then become a real specialist in in a particular area so i think that's certainly um you know thing that people should 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 bring in now then just remind me what was the question you asked again because i've Sorry. gone off on one <laughs> no just what kind of personality traits oh, yeah, that's do you it. need so having got your Sort of complementary skill set and ultimately the, one of the parts is you've got to be able to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and this is both a thing that is very important but it's also a thing that doesn't happen all the time so you really successful wine merchanting is about being able to sort of sit yourself in the perspective on the other side of the table and when you're, for instance, dealing with a restaurant owner, working within what we call the on trade, so restaurant owners, pub owners, hotel owners, often much as they're fascinated about wine, wine is wine can often be the single biggest driver into their bottom line. So if you just come in and say this wine's lovely and this wine's lovely and this one's lovely, that doesn't really work for them. They're thinking, will that wine help me pay my wages? Will that wine help me pay my gas bill? Mm. So having that perspective of saying look i'm going to help you write a really nice wine list here it is going to be creative it's going to tick lots of boxes it's going to go deliciously with your food it's also going to allow you to go and make the margins you need to be able to go and pay your wage bill rent rates whatnot um and and have a successful business when you're in a shop um it can be a more perhaps slightly more human kind of transaction. I'll give you a lovely story as a, mm. a lovely wine merchant I worked with many years ago. And he, he was a little bit scatterbrained and he was ordering the wines for the following week. He was stocking up and he wanted to order 12 bottles of a particularly expensive red burgundy. And by mistake, he ordered 12 cases. Oh. So he had 144 bottles of this oh, wine. Oh, my word. Which then, of course, made all his shop metrics go mad because suddenly he had this huge cost that he had to, to, to sort of carry against his metrics. And we were measured on this. So he needed to sell 144 bottles of very expensive red burgundy very quickly. And what he did was he blew his entire tasting budget on opening. I think it was something like about six bottles of it. But pretty much everyone who came with the Berkhamstead shop, he would say, he would, he would read them like a book. And then he would say something to get them to try this wine. So he would sort of say, you want to try this? I said, and you see, you could see they're a kind of car enthusiast type. Mm. So you'd say, oh, it's like driving an Aston Martin for an, you know, for an hour. It's gorgeous. <laughs> and they'd go and buy a sort of case. And then somebody else would come in and it'd be like a couple and he would sort of say, this is the most romantic, seductive wine you've ever had in your life. And, oh, they'd off go, for that, you know, perfect for the sort of dinner. And then there would be somebody coming in, you know, and you'd go, if you want to lay down a case of wine and see it mature over the next five, 10 years, this is it. All oh, right, they'd go off with 12 bottles of it. 
and he's a real art form isn't it that that kind of that salesman and it's fundamentally exactly the same thing as trying to make sure that you get the margins for a hotel and restaurant if you like because it's a consumer orientation marketers would call it a market orientation it's having that empathy and looking back and um the challenge to do that with wine is that of course sometimes you have to do that with a wine that's not necessarily your favorite you know it's not your kind of thing and then what you can't do is say well i don't really like sauvignon blanc so i'm not going to sell it millions <laughs> of people do like sauvignon blanc and for very good reasons the fact that you don't like it is of no consequence to them <laughs> so, um that's you know the biggest skill but also probably the one that gets lost in the mix the most mm. and at this point we usually talk about the biggest positives and, and opportunities but i thought now would be a great time to talk about the wine show um because i yeah. recently started watching a few of the episodes i'm on series one so i'm way back down but um i think i think the first ever was maybe sweet wines or dessert wines um and you're in italy and it was brilliant it's if anyone that hasn't watched it and, and you're you're a bit into wine, you can watch it at any level of, of wine knowledge and it's still really good and entertaining. But how did that sort of come about? And it must be brilliant fun to do. Well, you've answered, you, you've said all the right things because one of the bits we wanted, and, and I remember when I first got in touch, slightly thinking, just a minute, I've heard that line before. Um, and it was from an episode of Alan Partridge um where he'd he'd made a joke about wanting to make a genuinely popular television wine program it was always seen as being this thing that was kind of a joke it couldn't be done because wine couldn't be genuinely popular because it was necessarily elitist or you know obscure or something that kind of fans were and i just i've now had a slightly unusual career and i've made some television programs when i was much younger and had been a journalist so i've also worked as a, as a wine writer but I'd made some some television when I was very much younger and um years ago and this is one of those bits this is general career of this this I had spent a certain amount of time in the past as a tv presenter I'd, I'd worked in, in in sort of television it's slightly sort of uh, one of those things mad things that you do when you're you're young and years ago and this is probably about 15 years ago somebody had sent me to Argentina and they knew this and they wanted me to do a vlog remember vlogs mm. And at a spa, on this kind of buying stroke judging trip in Argentina, they have these health spas. They said, do you want to have a bath of wine? It's very good <laughs> for your skin. So I said, yeah, go on, hey, I'll jump in the spa. And I, I propped, I can't remember, it's like a little video camera, up at the tap end and talked to the camera and uploaded it onto YouTube, where literally nobody watched it for a decade. <laughs> And I think after 10 years, there's something like 72 views of this thing had happened. Anyway, the 73rd happened to be a television producer, a very brilliant TV producer called Melanie Jaffe, who had been given the impossible challenge of making a, a, a genuinely popular wine TV program. <laughs> and she gave me a phone call and she, oh, certainly she sent me a message on Twitter. She said, look, we're making this TV show. We've got a pilot coming up. Would you be interested? And um, within a week, actually, I think it was about sort of six days later, we'd, I'd, I was a wine merchant at the time and I, I took some slightly cheeky holiday and went to Burgundy. And in fact, I think the film we made is in about episode four of series one. It's when I buy a, a barrel of wine in, in Burgundy. Um, and the pilot went very well. We actually funded it ourselves because nobody thought you could make a, a genuinely popular wine TV show. Wow. So we had to raise all the money and um and then we went off to places like south africa and in fact that in south africa which was not too much of a spoiler as so i ended up drinking a 1796 van de constance which yes i watched napoleon. that episode yeah napoleon himself drunk that actual wine because it's so cool unbelievable uh, in um so yeah we made we now made three series so we we make it with um a, a kind of rolling roster of not drunk actors. We always have to say they're not drunk. <laughs> I promise you they're not drunk. Yes, we had Matthew Reese and Matthew Good in, uh, in Series 1. Goody, I think, was just off Downton Abbey at the time, and Matthew Reese was still making the Americans. Mm. And then um, Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks and Meryl Streep picked up Matthew Reese when we were filming Series 2. So we were there going, no, no, we want you to come with us <laughs> to make the show in France. And he was going, well, Steven Spielberg would like me to film with Tom Hanks and Meryl Streep. And I remember at one point sort of saying, oh, go on, you want to come drinking with us? Which I think he genuinely did. 
But um, no, so then James Purefoy um, joined us uh, from HBO's Rome and all sorts of phenomenal mm. series, just about to make another um, a, 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 a sequel to uh, it's that's Fisherman's Friends, that's it, the, the Cornish singing film. And then in series three, Matthew Good, for some reason, got terribly tied up. I think he was playing golf or something. So uh, <laughs> Dominic West from The Wire and The Affair joined us. And they, they, their role is not actually to be celebrities. Their role is to be the normal person. And this mm. is this thing. He's got to be grounded in the normal person. That's the truth of it. And that's why I enjoyed it so much, um, is that my job is they are just like 99% of people out there who like wine they've got no idea what it is they like and my job is to go let me find something for you and i so think we... that's what's so good about it is that you have these relatable people on the show and they're like you yeah, know I, I just like red wine to be honest that they don't and they they might like you know oh i like one particular type of red and then you'll come in and you'll be like well try this you might enjoy this and it was it kind of makes you go oh maybe i like that yeah it was the world's easiest job in a sense to go and do and i know that sounds mad i mean making television programs is <laughs> i have to tell you it's actually very hard and it's uh, in endless hours and there are all sorts of challenges but at its heart there was never any you know certainly for me all i had to do was exactly what i'd done in the shop and if i did that you know honestly and genuinely then we would be in a good place and so certainly that kind of comes through and, and and in some ways i think that's why as a show we've never been you know tried to sort of camp it up or make the whole thing seem slightly ridiculous or you know if there's something that it is ridiculous in the world of wine we poke fun at it because there are some sort of ridiculous things but actually you know the world of wine mostly it is extraordinarily generous kind lovely people who are doing a thing not because they have to but because they absolutely want to and because it reflects something of who they are it reflects something of their their being where they come from you know the time and the place that they they spend on on the globe if you like mm. and they want to be able to share that with people very honestly and that all you have to do is sort of step back and let people tell that story or help tell it for them to to some degree and um you know it was amazing it, it blew me away that certainly by this time we, we made three series now and by the time we finished series three there was a joke that we weren't allowed to finish filming an episode until either i'd cried the contributor had cried or the producer <laughs> cried um usually it was one of the three who at some point burst into tears um in my case certainly getting shot into a barrel for an hour oh, yeah. um, being hammered in that was pretty tearful being shouted at by a russian separatist at a communist party rally in <laughs> moldova and that was um that was a squeaky bomb moment <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of fair to say and i got quite tearful actually about georgia i just absolutely loved it but i held it together there and it was the producer who sobbed when i did my final line and we we knew it was good because she was in tears because it'd been so magical and because it's the first place of wine so it was uh it was yeah, I, I read something online which is probably not true at all but china kind of claimed that they started wine as well there's certainly a very ancient claim whether it's exactly the sort of modern day great wine it's certainly making rice wine we know very very ancient kind of rice wines um i think certainly because, i mean apart from anything else because we know vitis vinifera which is the grape we make uh, wine from there are lots of different grapes as mm. it comes as you'll learn when you go and do your wset course there are lots of different <laughs> grapes europe only had one whereas china and the united states or modern day you know the united states north america um so sort of east asia and, and, and north america they had a lot of different species of grape europe actually only had one it had this grape vitis vinifera and um, that sort of originates and grows out of the Caucasus today, which is where people start burying it in sort of clay vessels and it ferments. And then and when they drink what appears to have gone off, it then makes them <laughs> sing and dance and probably get quite fruity with each other. <laughs> so they think this is amazing stuff. And that's sort of birth of the wine trade. And certainly, you know, we find an awful lot of interesting subspecies 
lots of varieties coming out of places like Turkey. So, you know, within that kind of Caucasus uh, corridor, if you like. In China, there are, uh, I think, Vitis rotundiflora, I think is from China, I might be wrong. I know certainly things like uh, Vitis labrusca, which is a species comes from North America. Um, you'll learn all about why they nearly killed off the European wine trade when you do your, your courses. Um, but oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. China does have a China today is one of the great emerging wine powers. It's probably the fifth, sixth largest winemaker in the world. Um, certainly emerging into one of the largest wine consumers mm. in the world. Um, and they have some extraordinary regions. A great friend of mine has a, a winery, which runs a winery in a place called Ningxia, which is in uh, sort of outer Mongolia. Um, and it's brutally cold in the winter. They have to bury the vines. and literally every year bury them under a mound of earth wow. because it gets to like minus 40 and the, the, the wood splits and then they have to dig them all back up again every spring and they make, um, Amazing. make great red wines. Well, talking of like, you know, trying different wines from different places, um, we, a couple of um, people, uh, me and my girlfriend's family, have signed up to your um, wine tasting on Thursday. Portuguese oh, wines. Yes. Um, so uh, is, is wine tasting and getting other people interested in wine, is that the best way to do it as a wine merchant, you know, doing these tastings? You've mentioned a few stories where, you know, people or shops you've worked in have, have done the tastings. Is, is that the best way? Yeah, it, 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 there is a solid chunk of that. Yeah, absolutely. And certainly I think people coming in, you don't have to be an extrovert to work in the wine trade. And there are lots of jobs that aren't, but it is, it is a trade, certainly like all sales jobs, where an element of extroversion and being happy to present helps you know a great deal actually as buyers so you get jobs in the sort of back office and buying jobs you don't need to be you know a great sort of show person my job has tended to be customer fronting and customer you know facing it and it's done that way now today we get to do it on zoom and in fact this week on thursday i will see you because i'll be doing it on zoom <laughs> and i do it a lot so i do tastings not only like we're doing on thursday i do tastings for actually quite a um, I'm not even allowed to say who they are, but for a very prestigious law firm in the United States, uh, which often means doing the tasting is about three o'clock in the morning because they're all in California and they're having an early evening <laughs> do, and I've got to get up go and do it. Um, or I'll go and do, you know, I do quite a lot of tastings for, you know, large banks or insurance companies and other organisations. I had the joy before Christmas uh, of doing a, a celebration Christmas tasting for a group of people who had been scaling up Britain's um, vaccination capacity. Oh, wow. Uh, it was the Oxford AstraZeneca part of the, the team who'd been building up the, our ability to go and produce lots of vaccine. They wanted to thank all the team very much for the extraordinary work that they'd done. And so we hosted a wine tasting. It was great fun. Um, actually, it's a great way to kind of get in and to sort of get your eye in for being able to talk to audiences. I, I remember, I know my first ever tasting. I was working in a, a wine shop in York and uh, Bill, who was my boss, he had, for some reason he had a swimming night so he couldn't do wine tastings on a Thursday. He was always very adamant that he wouldn't miss his swimming night. And the <laughs> Sherbin in Elmet Women's Institute wanted a wine tasting. And so he was about to turn them down, but then I said, I would do it. And I think he was somewhat suspect. So anyway, I sort of, bunged a load of bottles in the back of my somewhat rubbishy car and uh, trundled out. I don't know if you've ever been to Sherbin in Elmet. It's a very small, it's quite a lovely, it's a lovely place. It's just outside York. And I was, I gave this tasting. It was probably just like me banging on now and chatted <laughs> to all these ladies of a certain age. They were all slightly, you know, they were sort of slightly high synth bouquet. And they absolutely loved it. They had a brilliant time. And they are certainly not the last WIs I've had the joy of speaking to. I love doing uh, tastings for WIs. They're always great fun. Um, and a lot of it even then was about, well, who likes this? Who doesn't like this? Why do you like it? And actually it's about throwing it back to the other person. I'll tell you, it's... A Sancerre, it's made with Sauvignon Blanc. It comes from this, here's an interesting story about where the soil is. This is something about the producer. What's then interesting, what's really fascinating with tastings is to go, and who loves this? And why do you love it? What does it say to you? What should we do with this? And uh, that's where the, the fun of tastings is. If you are really, if you're already into wine, actually, um, you know, do some tastings for your friends. You know, if you can't get together, do it on Zoom. Mm. Um, I'm probably doing about three Zoom tastings a week at the moment. It's wow. exhausting. <laughs> um, uh, on the sort of flip side of uh, of all of this, what is one of the negative or less favourable aspects of the industry? 
Um, because it's a fashion industry, the money isn't that great. I mean, really, it's not that it's terrible, but the money isn't that. It's not one of those, nobody goes and joins the wine trade to go make lots and lots of money. And sometimes you, sometimes I think one of the great challenges you find is that people join it perhaps in their twenties and they love it, they don't really mind. And then it becomes a bit more of a difficulty if you've not managed to progress through a couple of rungs and got yourself into a managerial role, it's not necessarily the best paid trade when you're you know, having kids and wanting mortgages and, and whatnot. No, it's not as though it's a, you know, certainly, it's not as though it's a terribly badly paid uh, trade, uh, but it's not like, you know, certainly not like being a lawyer or an accountant or something. And you certainly, as a general rule, we often say, you know, the wine trade is filled with people who could universally earn more money if they did something else. But they do this because they absolutely love it. Um, there are certain fringe benefits. I mean, in the end, usually if you work for a decent employer, they'll let you go and have a, a you know, sort of decent staff sales account. And so you can buy wine at cost and people certainly do. They enjoy it very much. <laughs> and you get to have some fab experiences. You often get to go and travel overseas as part of your job. So you might take customers, you know, have a brilliant trip, taking them to Italy or France or Spain and, uh, and get to, to sort of trundle around doing that. Um, and you do get to work with something that you, you really adore. Mm. Um, but, you know, even certainly when you look at chief executives in the business you know they don't own what chief executives in other businesses do um, well, we we usually go away and we look for the average income for every industry and then just see if you would agree with it um it was it was slightly harder with wine merchants but we came out at about twenty seven thousand annual salary does that sound about right to you yeah, it does. Absolutely. I think that's certainly for sort of shop based wine merchants. That's about right. If you what would tend to happen is that people would be on around, let's say, 27,000, something like that, 27, 28,000, perhaps a bit more if they're in London, so on. Um, the, the big challenge, and this is certainly one of those things, I think, when you join the trade where you want to sort of come in and then think, right, if I'm going to enjoy this, where do I go to next? And I think the mistake people sometimes make is, oh, this is great fun. And then they need to go and move on to the next step. And they go, oh, no, I've not even thought about how to go and do that. You know, you may well find that you could jump into something that's maybe 35,000 doing certainly field based sales into hotels and restaurants. And uh, sometimes sommeliers might go and do that. Often people from shops will then go and progress into that sort of a role. Um, management level roles then in that sort of a field would be of the order of, you know, 45, maybe even 50,000, something like that. So, you, you know, you can end up having a really nice job. You've got a lovely house. You've got a nice, you know, you get a car, a computer and a, a phone and whatnot. You can, and, you know, one of my, sometimes people say, what was the best part of your job? And now, now I've made, TV shows about wine, I know, phenomenal bits. I have to tell you, on a day-to-day -day basis, the greatest job I ever had was being a field-based wine merchant. You get up, drop your kids off at school, get in the car, and then drive off into the countryside going and visiting lovely hotels <laughs> and talking to them about what wine they're going to go and buy. And you, you know, chat to your team in the car, hands-free, uh, as you go around, you know, you grab a sandwich somewhere, get yourself home in the evening, maybe once, twice a week, you go and host a dinner and uh, and do a tasting or you do some training with staff in the afternoon. It's a really, really lovely job. And there are some people who do that all their lives because they enjoy it so much. You know, you meet new people all the time. And certainly, you know, I, um, you know, sort of commend it to, to people. It's challenging to earn much more than, I mean, I know it sounds like a lot of money. It is a lot of money, but you know even quite senior roles often you know it can be difficult getting much above sort of 60 70 000 pounds mm -hmm. and that's when people have been in the trade for a very long time and some of their peers might be earning more than that and, and you know when you've devoted 30 years of your life and you're thinking this is going to be amazing you know there is something of a of a cap but um so you're coming in twenty seven thousand, yeah absolutely ask for that if they ask you <laughs> more, say no i want that and would you still go into this industry knowing everything you know now it's a, it's a bizarre story, actually. Just before I joined the, the wine trade, when I'd still wanted to be a soldier, I'd, I'd just been told I think, by the army that I couldn't join. Um, I happened to meet, of all people, Prince Andrew, uh, sort of somewhat questionable figure these days, but he, mm. he was my uncle's helicopter pilot many years ago. Oh. Yeah. So my uncle was his captain and he was a helicopter pilot. So I, I met him on board this ship. And he said, what was I going to go and do? And Prince Andrew said, uh, I said I was joining the wine trade. And I remember him being incredibly snooty and dismissive. He sort of cast his hand and said, oh, no, don't want to do that. 
I said, really? He said, oh, no. He said, the wine trade's dead in Britain. He said, you'll be spend your life hoping for, a, you know, looking for something to go and do. He said, nobody's interested in the wine business. Now, I remember years later, looking back, he said that literally at the start of the largest sustained boom in wine sales <laughs> ever known in the United Kingdom. Within 10 years of him saying that, you're more likely to find a bottle of wine in a British fridge than a packet of butter, which remains really? true to this day. You know, the UK has more than 30 million wine drinkers, reasonably oh. regular wine drinkers, more than 30 million of them in, in the UK today. Mm. It's a it's embedded in our sort of national psyche in our national life. Yes, absolutely. I would still come in and, and join the wine trade. It will change. It will become certainly, you know, the movement online is a significant thing. I now work broadly in the world of supporting wine merchants in what they sometimes call the omni-channel, but, you know, selling some online and selling some in shops. So the ability to flex around that is going to be important. The ability to use digital media to be able to talk to people through email and social media and so on, it, you know, is, is increasingly important to do tastings online. Um, that actually matters, uh, you know, a lot, I suspect, in most businesses, but certainly in, in wine, that's very true. But it's no less vibrant and exciting. And, you know, when I started it, chili was probably about a paragraph in a wine textbook mm. you can now buy entire books that talk, talk of nothing but <laughs> um china was a sort of you know it would have been a joke you know chinese cabernet sauvignon uh, chinese cabernet sauvignon is among some of the finest wines in the world now and you can spend about 200 quid buying <laughs> it's jolly expensive um you know, wine in, in England, there are, what, seven vineyards in Yorkshire, something mm. like that. Um, England makes some of the finest sparkling wine in the world. Um, it, you know, it is absolutely extraordinary. And yet, you know, it, it, it always amazes me. I love telling people this story. England makes some of the finest sparkling wine in the world. The first man to make English sparkling wine is still alive to this day. Oh, really? He's very, very elderly, but Bill Carker is still on the go. And he's a lovely, lovely man. Wow. Wow. Um, so, you know, that shows you we are still in the lifetime of the man who made the product. And today we see it beating the rest of the world. So it's a, it's a great business to be in. This is probably a, a terrible question to end on, Joe. But um, what is your favourite type of wine? Um, genuinely, pretty much whatever's in front of me at the time. <laughs> um, I'm an extraordinarily Catholic small C drinker. Um, so I, and part of it it's a very difficult question you know the, the easier one is if you could only drink certain wines i would tend to take mm. white bordeaux which i'm a huge fan of so you love a white bordeaux uh, which is very underrated people don't see it very much and chianti classico i think is magically brilliant and um and it's got to be classico not just chianti chianti classico those are two of my absolute sort of favorite wines but you know last night i had a bottle of ribera sacra which comes from um, northwest uh northwest spain i'm drinking a lot actually of these sort of super toscans um partly actually because i've been working with some super toscan wine producers and quite a bit from california recently i drink lots of old bordeaux um mm. and that's partly because of the wine tastings that i do with these americans who uh, there's this law firm who like uh, like drinking old bordeaux and, and and white burgundy um i drink a lot of champagne my wife is a great champagne specialist so we drink some particularly brilliant champagne uh, and I drink a lot actually of English sparkling wine I think that's because I know lots of English fizz producers mm. I do drink an awful lot of English fizz um but it is pretty much you know somebody opened something up somebody opened a few years ago somebody opened a bottle of dry ferment I've never had dry ferment before uh, I'd had ferment Tokai, the sweet wine this was made dry um it's why now I recommend everybody in the world drink dry <laughs> ferment and of course you get it because somebody goes try this it's a Hungarian dry white. And you think, oh my goodness, this is going to be terrible. <laughs> and then you realise it's magically brilliant. Yeah. Um, and in fact, I've now moved on because I now drink a, it's, it sounds rude, it's, taste, it's much tastier. There's a wine called Ufark, mm. um, a great variety called Ufark, which you get in um, a very small town called Shomla in Hungary. And I'm a big... Um, a big Ufark from Shomla drinker. So um, <laughs> apparently if you drink it on your wedding night, it means that you'll have a son. Oh. Is your first child? Well, Hungarians love them. They're <laughs> mad. We filmed that in series three. So, if you want to see me in appalling sportswear uh, with a former competitor for Mister Universe, Jan <laughs> <laughs> Jan Kish, who was just a lovely, lovely man. Um, if you see him 
just being embarrassed at my attempts to do weight training <laughs> and um, that's series three of the wine show on amazon prime it's great fun well i look forward to series three and thank you so much for coming on and chatting joe it's um it's been really really interesting it's an absolute pleasure daniel thank you for having me and where can people find you on social media or websites or anything else like that there aren't that many Joe Fatterinis. Uh, I think there's only one other. So I am at Joe Fatterini, F-A-T-T-O-R-I-N-I on uh, Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. And uh, I'll be there somewhere in on LinkedIn as well. Uh, if you look at Wine Show TV, that's uh, that's the wine show. Uh, again, on uh, certainly Instagram and, and Twitter, you can follow us sort of both there. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And drop us a line. We love to hear from people. Um, we sometimes get the maddest ideas for future episodes when people drop us a, a sort of middle of the night tweet when they've had a drink. <laughs> well, thanks again, Joe.